All right, you can go ahead and get started, Stephen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our second round of TED Style Talks. Today, we're beginning with COVID-19 exposure control plans, the key to OSHA compliance during the pandemic. Speaking on that topic for us is Mr. Aaron Gelb, a partner in the Kahn Massiel Carey Law Firm. Aaron advises employers through inspections and enforcement actions involving OSHA, federal OSHA and state OSHA programs, but he also manages the full range of litigation regarding OSHA issues. He's based in the Chicago office and leads the Midwest uh, practice area of the firm and is also co-chair of the firm's COVID-19 task force. Aaron, take us through OSHA today. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and just just jump right into the first slide. Um, it's been really nothing but OSHA COVID compliance for the last three, four months for us. And one of the real challenges that employers have faced is pulling everything together uh, that <coughs> have to been doing, need to do, are considering doing. Um, there are, are questions as far as, you know, is OSHA really enforcing anything right now? There's only been one OSHA citation issued apparently to anybody across the country. Um, but at the same time, there are tons of inspections going on. That's really what's keeping us busy. Uh, th nearly 20,000 complaints have been filed alleging inadequate workplace protections. Uh, I think nearly six or 700 fatality inspections have been opened by the agency. And those inspections take time. So whomever thinks that OSHA is not doing anything, you know that that's one perspective. But I, I can assure everybody, for those of us that are OSHA lawyers, uh, OSHA has been very active, very busy, and I expect to see citations starting in the next two to three months. Um, so how can you protect yourselves in the meantime? What do you need to do? One of the most important steps from our perspective is to develop an exposure control plan. So what is an exposure control plan? Uh, it's basically, it's a written document. Uh, it's, it's your opportunity, it's your mechanism of pulling everything together into one handy place. You know, think of a, a, a handbook, think of other policies that you put on your, you put in a shelf in a book, in a, in a binder, and you can pull it out when you need it. Um, here, you know, how, however you decide to do that, whether it's, it's on your intranet, whether it's, it's actual hard copy policy, you want to have one ready source that people can consult uh, when there are questions, so employees understand what you're doing. Um, it, it's really distilling down all the elements, all the protective measures into one place, one handy reference. Uh, the reason it's important and, and why I think OSHA is, is recommending this, although they haven't required it, uh, is for any particularly important safety protocol or procedure such as lockout, tagout, hazard communication, which is something that many hotels are familiar with, um, respiratory protection, you need a written program in addition to all the other elements of it. Keep in mind also that one size does not fit all. This is not a situation where you want to go online, pull something off the internet, print it out, and start using it without customizing it to your workplace. It has to be specific to the hazards, to the jobs that exist at your workplace. So if we move to the next slide, um, why do you need an exposure control plan? As I said, OSHA recommends them. If you go back to their guidance from March 9th, uh, it's, it's front and center in there. The CDC recommends exposure control plans, and we're starting to see many more jurisdictions that are requiring them. Puerto Rico requires them. It's virtually a requirement in California, New York, and uh, as we were talking about recently, Virginia is in the process of issuing an emergency temporary standard specifically for COVID-19 that will permit fines up to $124,000. Uh, and I believe that an exposure control plan is going to be a mandated element there. Uh, this helps you ensure that you don't overlook anything. If anybody knows uh, when there's an emergency, when there's when something comes up, whatever element it is, you have a, your first positive COVID employee, how do you respond to that? If you don't have it written down, if it's not in a policy or an SOP, there's a chance that mistakes are gonna be made. It's also a very effective communication tool. It helps you communicate to your employees so they know what's going on, so they don't operate under the assumption that you're not taking sufficient measures, and maybe that keeps them from complaining to OSHA. So it can improve morale and improve employee engagement. And frankly, there's no better document to have to present to OSHA if you get a complaint 
you show them that you've got a well-written exposure control plan, they're gonna be far more comfortable and hopefully move on to the next employer and take a harder look at them. So the next question to, to answer is, what should be included in your exposure control plan? Um, whatever measures you're taking to eliminate the hazard, which is exposure to COVID completely, put that in your plan, working from home, uh, keeping people out of the workplace. Whatever measures you are to screen employees as well as visitors and guests, that should be a, a key element of your plan. Your social distancing measures, engineering controls, which are things like plexiglass barriers, uh, ventilation changes, those are hard, hard changes, and I should say physical changes that are made to the workplace, put those in there. Make sure you cover cleaning and sanitizing, which is going to be enhanced, more frequent, new chemicals, cover all that. What you're going to do to respond to confirmed cases, you need a protocol in place so people know what to do in the event of that emergency. Uh, it's a controversial topic, but co consider and address face coverings if you're requiring them or, or when they're required, if they're not always required. And other forms of PPE, we can talk uh, separately about whether face coverings are PPE. They're really not. They're not protecting the wearer. They're protecting everybody else, but they are important. Uh, and then last, what is your training and communication? It's very difficult to train and communicate with people right now. You're not supposed to have meetings, so how are you going to do that? Cover that in your plan. And then uh, moving on to the next slide, how do you prepare your exposure control plan? Uh, you really need to take time. It's, it, this is an involved process. Uh, and you, what you're doing is you're preparing a detailed and, and very specific risk assessment of every aspect of your operation. So for a hotel, you're looking at how do we handle guests when they come into the lobby? How do we reduce the likelihood of transmission during the check-in process? What are we gonna do about our elevators? What are we gonna do about food service? How is that gonna be done? Do, do, does, do the room service attendants not enter the room? Uh, what happens to the fitness area, to the pool? You, I can go on and on, obviously. Um, but you need to address that, consider all these different elements and the various jobs that your employees are performing in those areas and how you're going to keep them safe. Um, the, the, each job, can, you, you may have different levels of risk depending on the position. So people who work back of the house in the kitchens, um, you don't encounter guests, lower level of risk than people say at front desk or in serving positions. Uh, ideally, you're going to create a cross-functional team that includes managers and supervisors from various departments so everybody has input. Um, and, and if possible, and certainly recommended, include your employees. They're the ones that encounter the risks most directly in many cases. So you want to hear from them, get their perspective. Uh, if, if you hopefully have a decent relationship with your unions, give them a seat at the table if possible. Um, that's certainly something that former OSHA officials who have been in the news a lot uh, are recommending uh, as, and holding up examples of companies that have done that. Uh, many of our clients are retaining experts, medical experts, consultants. Uh, they can be invaluable in helping you prepare an exposure control plan and helping you recognize and talk about things that maybe you weren't familiar with or maybe you didn't recognize were issues that you need to consider. Um, and last but not least, document you, every lawyer you hear probably in most speeches is going to tell you at some point to document what you're doing. Um, this is particularly important here. I had a recent conversation with an OSHA official in Chicago who shared with me that they have found and figured out a way to go back and bookmark or determine when CDC issued certain types of guidance. And the CDC, as I'm sure everybody knows, their guidance is changing and it's evolving. So what OSHA is, is in a position to do now is to look back and say, what was the guidance in place on a certain date? And then they can peg and look at whether the employer was following that guidance that was in effect at that time. Um, so you really want to make sure you could go back if you're pushed or questioned in an inspection and, and asked, what were you doing at this point in time and why, that you've got documents that you can point to. Uh, and the same goes, goes true for um, other OSHA requirements that you may not be able to comply with because of the pandemic. Document your efforts to comply and what you're doing in lieu of your ability to comply because of the pandemic. Uh, so I hope folks will join us in the uh, breakout session so we can dive into these and other issues in more depth. Thank you. Gosh, Aaron, thank you very much. What a great way to begin and great details and excellent examples, step-by-step -step procedures, really terrific. Thank you kindly for joining us. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, next up, is the mother of invention, how food and beverage companies successfully altered their business models to deal with COVID-19 and beyond. 
Joining us today on this topic is Mr. David Denny, the founder of the Denny Law Group. David is also the president of the Greater Dallas Restaurant Association, a board member of the Texas Restaurant Association, and he speaks frequently on topics related to the Dallas, uh, I'm sorry, to the restaurant and alcohol and food and beverage industries. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome David Denny. Good day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my practice uh, focuses almost exclusively on restaurants and bars in the independent space. Uh, so that's mainly what we'll be talking about. Well, it is what we'll be talking about today. Um, and so it has been a uh, hundred days of absolute hell. And I know that everyone who's joining us on the presenting end or the receiving end of this program uh, has experienced their own hundred days of hell uh, in their own way. And so I have a lot of empathy uh, for all of you. Um, and I've had a hundred of the same conversation over and over, whether it's about alcohol or whether it's about COVID positive employees or any other thing. And so we're going to try to deal with how some of these uh, restaurants and bars have, um, have not only changed how they operate, but, but how, how those are likely to survive COVID um, into and when we return to normal and it will be the new paradigm of how to move forward. Uh, and some of these innovations are gonna stay with us. So as we move forward, we're gonna look at a couple of, um, a couple of concepts who, who have adopted brand new ways of doing things, just like every other, whether, you're, whether you work with restaurant companies, you are a restaurant company, or you are a consumer of a restaurant company, you have seen people who never did delivery or to go before learn immediately the week of March 16th how to do delivery and to go. And some of them learned quickly and some of them learned a little slower than others, uh, but it was not an easy transition for so many of these places because they were not set up logistically. And so many of them um, defaulted immediately to using third-party delivery systems, which we'll cover a little bit. In fact, that's what my presentation was originally supposed to be about uh, before COVID changed our, our entire uh, conference. Um, and so they did sort of, uh, Fall in, fall in with some third-party delivery companies, and, and we'll talk about that and its ramifications toward the end of the presentation. But what you see here on this slide are a couple of different kinds of independent concepts. They, uh, somebody recently used the term chainlet, and I love it because you're not a big chain, and you may or be more than a local chain, but you're a chainlet, so you're not a humongous chain. And I, I think it conveys um, a, a, great, a great deal of information. So on, on, your, on the left side of your screen, you see Kyle Noonan and I, I had to drag my slider just to find the perfect look on his face um, because that's how that's what I do with Kyle. And um, this one says, oh no, <laughs> it's not actually what he's saying, but I just love it. And so Kyle owns the Rust, he's one of the owners of the Rustic, uh, which is a very large format restaurant, bar, music venue, um, expanding into other cities. They also own Mutt's Canine Cantina, which is a uh, growing concept, uh, franchise concept of the year at NRA or something like that last year. And it's full service, it's high alcohol, and it's experiential with music and other things. What Kyle did, Kyle turned the Rustic into a bodega. They started selling toilet paper, fruits, vegetables uh, to, to go. They started um, posting like crazy on social media, uh, really high quality stuff. And about halfway through these past 100 days, Kyle started doing a, a, a cooking with Kyle segment from his house where he would make a, a raw set of ingredients available for purchase during the week. And then on Sunday, he would cook that meal and people could follow along on Instagram or Facebook with him. So he called it cooking with Kyle. So he made a cocktail, he cooked a meal, and then he actually had a performer from the local music scene in his backyard. And they, uh, and so, so that the performers who were also uh, had all of their income destroyed by COVID, were able to feature, be featured, um, sell some music, sell a little bit of swag, and all of the uh, proceeds of that went directly to the performer. So an amazing innovation from, uh, from, from just from an unexpected source, uh, because they, somebody who's really good on social media is not necessarily really good behind the camera. And, and I hope that this kind of innovation survives the current set of things, the current state of things, and lives on because it's a, an amazing way to engage people who are stuck at home, safe at home, just getting back into the dining scene. Um, 
and it's really been wonderful to see this kind of stuff. Uh, Chef Nikki, on the other in the other image, she is with Asian Mint, and she figured out a way to vacuum seal the component parts of to-go meals so that people could follow along with her on Facebook. They could go online on YouTube, follow her YouTube channel, watch how to cook these things. And those are raw ingredients that they can make Asian mint cuisine at home. And it isn't just a to-go con container. It's very well thought out the way that she's packaged these things. This article is actually from uh, the cover of Restaurant Hospitality Magazine. Um, featuring her and her innovation that she came up with uh, in late March. Um, and and I, I would be shocked if they didn't continue to do this uh, when, we, when we achieve some stability because it has, uh, uh, the, whole, the whole name of the game has been how do you foster engagement? And this is amazing engagement from somebody with three or four restaurants. Um, and, and not only that, but she sends her servers out to, for to-go pickup they with a smile, they dance out the door. It's just been, it's a great experience for somebody who's just pulling up into a regular old parking lot, picking up food to take home. Um, and they have tried to engage at every step of the process where they get to touch their guests. It's, it's really fantastic. Here's one more as we move on. Take and bake pizza from people who never did take and bake pizza before. And I have a few clients who, who did this and made this pivot some sooner than others. And this is Eno's Pizza Tavern here in, in, the, in the Dallas area. And uh, they, they never thought they were going to be in the take and bake pizza business, but they got into the take and bake pizza business really fast. And uh, this is just, just a great way to engage. And it's, uh, some of the fine print is, you know, it's a, home, it's a pizza party at home. Everybody likes to make pizza at home, but some people are better at it than others. But if, if Eno's does all the hard work, you know, why does Papa Murphy get to be the only person that does take and bake pizza? So these pizza places have, um, not, they set up uh, uh, pop-up spots to sell their to-go pizzas, to sell other things, um, as much swag as they could, uh, and to-go drink kits and things like that. And, and again, like, the, look at the look on her face. I mean, that is how you engage with your guests right there. Uh, it's priceless. Um, and speaking of, of to-go booze, here's Here's where we're headed in the next slide. To go booze has been uh, extraordinarily controversial, and some of you in other states outside of Texas have um, have have it even better than we do because you can actually sell sell or or take home a mixed drink straight from the restaurant. In Texas, uh, we're one of a few states where you have to sell the mix and a bottle, uh, and we have the wonkiest alcohol laws ever. We're probably one of the most five restrictive states in the nation, and and it shows right here because. The delivery rules allow for the delivery of an unlimited number of uh, 375 milliliter bottles of booze with an order just because. It, you could buy four of them. You can't buy two full-size bottles, but you could buy four 375s, whatever. So don't get me started. Are we, this isn't a time for a soapbox, but that's just stupid. But anyway, the, so, so what you were able to do rather than go to the store and buy your own mix was to get the actual mix from your actual you know, neighborhood joint or your, every, everybody was doing this. And so in states where you could take a mixed drink back in your car uh, with the, you know, in the honor system that you weren't gonna drink it in your car, uh, that was one thing. But in, in Texas and other states where you had a little bit more restriction, the engagement was, we'll give you the mix, you'll mix it at home and it'll just be a party in your mouth just like you would have here at our restaurant. And uh, I mean, that not only did it move booze, like it put, it put a lot of coin in the, in the people selling minis, but, um, you know, it moved booze where booze wasn't otherwise being moved. And so if it had not been allowed, we would have seen, we would have seen a lot more closures because it was an essential impact to the bottom line for restaurants. And in Texas, bars were closed. They were, they've only, they were closed from March 18th to, to May 1st. And or May 1st, I think, maybe May 18th. Um, but bars took it so hard. I mean, so much harder than restaurants because they were forced to, like many states, just go completely dark. Um, at least in Texas, we were allowed to stay open with restaurants for to-go and delivery, thank God. Um, but, but the bars weren't even able to do this. So it has been, it is, this is an innovation that I think, not only has Governor Abbott uh, mentioned a couple of times that maybe to-go booze in some form or another is here to stay, which I think is great. Um, that I think it's another way to engage, send those flavors home uh, with your guest, 
give them something that they, an, a restaurant item they can't replicate and they get to continue to be part of your experience. So all of these innovations hopefully will remain and, um, and we'll see them even become more refined in the future as, as we achieve stability. Uh, so the other thing that people have done to innovate is, is really move forward in nonprofit. And the we, I call March 16th the first day of the darkness. And, and that Monday, March 16th, was when everybody in the nation found out that all the restaurants were about to close. By the end of the week of March 18th, we had worked on two nonprofit projects and we were in talks with other people to discuss nonprofits. So the Dinner Bell Foundation that we created was um, a restaurant here that, that put a platform together. They partnered with Accenture, they, they partnered with Mark Cuban and some other, uh, some other assets to sell restaurant food uh, and put, put some coin into the pocket of independent restaurants. They, they were feeding first responders through restaurant companies and they were putting the restaurants together with the need uh, and, and with, with, a, with a low cost option to feed first responders. It was amazing. Um, it's still going and, and it, uh, it, 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 it may not need to survive COVID, but the idea will survive. And it's sort of like the Cajun Navy. We can create this anytime we need to. They can just show up whenever there's another crisis. And it's a really wonderful platform. Um, the next one that we have to talk about is, uh, I think it's called DFW, uh, DFW. No, it's Furlough Kitchen. So Furlough Kitchen was started by Randy DeWitt and, uh, and his team. And Furlough Kitchen was using furloughed employees to serve furloughed employees. So people that were put out of work by restaurant and bar closures were able to come and get a meal. They served uh, 60,000 meals in DFW and they actually put the framework for furlough kitchen into open source Google documents and people around the country adopted it and they, they served a total of 100,000 meals in about 65 days. Uh, fantastic, amazing pivot. Um, and again, it can be replicated at need, which, um, which is just, I mean, this framework will be with us beyond this. These are just some of the lessons that we have learned through the innovation of people that had resources and time. Um, and the next one is DFW Eats, which is another, oh no, Staff Meal, sorry. Staff Meal was uh, first put forward through one of our culinary schools. Um, and it was a way to get restaurant employees and hospitality workers meals when they were uh, down on their luck. Um, and it was, Partner, they, they did a partnership with lots of their food purveyors and, um, and were able to sell three day parts of, or, or serve three day parts of meals to hospitality industry and service industry workers. Absolutely fascinating um, and just wonderful. So third party delivery is a huge bugaboo and it was a bugaboo before and it's even worse now because um, as you'll see on the next slide, on March 30th, when my friend Jay Jarrier said that Uber is wartime profiteering off restaurants because Uber was going out into the media and talking about how they had free delivery fees for the customers, how it was supporting local restaurants, but it didn't change on the restaurant end. And on the, so on the user end, it did not change at all. And so they were still paying 30% at a time where they needed revenue more than anything. And so there were some of the platforms like DoorDash that, that, created uh, in inaugural pricing for people that had never been on the platform before, but you, it had a lot of restrictions on it. You weren't able to use other platforms. You could only sign up with them. You had to sign a really long agreement. And uh, boy, it was, it was tough because those services, as you've probably all seen in the media and through um, social media from restaurateurs, I mean, 30% to the bottom line is an astronomical amount. Now that's March 30th. Fast forward to May 8th, and I, my friend Jay says, we're desperate enough to do deals with Uber Eats, so come order from us, although we'd still really rather you just order our direct delivery or pick up from us. And that, that, that just represents a sea change in attitude uh, because it was Uber Eats, or I mean, it was third-party delivery or nothing um, for a lot of these people. They did not have the framework uh, and, and so this is, so Jay Jarrier has Cane Rosa, which is a Neapolitan pizza restaurant, and they didn't do self-delivery because Neapolitan pizza doesn't really travel very far, very well um, because of its nature. 
Um, it's not like a Domino's. It's not like a hard crust pizza. And, and they had no choice. And they, they didn't have their own delivery infrastructure. And so when there were other pizza places putting out massive amounts of social media ads for delivery drivers, places that are more bespoke had a really hard time pivoting into the delivery model and just went straight into third-party delivery. Um, and it was extremely, extremely costly for them um, and continues to be, it just continues to be. And so some of the concerns that we have with third-party delivery are beyond cost. But it wasn't until May 18th that Uber said that it was going to require its drivers to wear masks. And I am a prolific user of third-party delivery, even though I know that it's detrimental to the restaurants. I am selfish and a couple of times a week when I can't leave the office, I'm gonna use it. And I was astounded by the frequency of deliveries that I had where drivers were not wearing masks. I was also surprised that people continued to leave their packaging open um, to be, you know, sort of contaminated or not within the, within the delivery driver's vehicle, whether it's Uber Eats or something else. I mean, Uber Uber's just a, a really big one and it tends to take a lot of arrows, but May 18th is a long time uh, before they were requiring their drivers to wear masks. Um, and the other concern is food safety. Uh, and so I have, I highly recommend that if you are not using uh, tamper evident or tamper proof seals, stickers, containers, something to assure your guest uh, who is using delivery to obtain your food, that you immediately implement that. There are numerous products out there. 3M makes thousands and billions of stickers um, that you can acquire. And um, the reason is that Uber Eats drivers are Uber drivers. They are not trained on how to handle food. And we've talked about this in 2017 when I gave a presentation at, at the Hospitality Law Conference on third-party delivery. That was still a concern. Um, there are conditions in the contract that if you have not negotiated them out, put, put indemnity or put, put indemnification from you, the user, to them, the delivery company. Um, it allocates risk to the restaurant, not to the delivery company, and you've lost chain of custody of your product. And so you really should consider that. Let's move the, to the next one. Um, and this is just a little look at tamper resistant versus tamper evident. Either one is a good thing to use. Tamper evidence shows somebody tried to get into it. Tamper resistant means it's gonna make it really hard for them to get into it. But, um, but I've had items go missing from my order uh, before. I've had people who uh, will swear that their French fries have been eaten. Um, and, I, and we know based on uh, polls that have been reported in the press that about a third of drivers have admitted to sampling food out of their delivery bags. That is astronomical sum and it's gross. So I would really, and if you're, if all you do is staple the bag shut, staple the freaking bag shut, just do it. Um, and then in fact, that's the, that's the next one. Seals, staper, staples, stickers, whatever. And then the last one is, this is a holdover from the presentation that I was going to give about third party delivery is that if you do not have a mechanism where the total cost that the, the gross cost of your sales are, are not, uh, are, are being, let me start over. If you don't have a mechanism where you're not getting credit for the 30% that you're paying to the delivery company that's netted out of your bottom line number, that's going toward percentage rent, you need to work on that immediately. Because if you are paying percentage rent to your landlord on gross sales, and your gross sales includes the 30% VIG that the, that the food service delivered, that the third party delivery company is charging, you're overpaying and you're inaccurately reporting gross sales. Um, most, of the, most of the way that is reconciled with the food service company is that you get the total sale and their charge comes out separately. And if you're showing your total 100% gross sale to your landlord, you're gonna be paying percentage rent on too big of a number. That is not gonna go away. That concern is gonna remain with us. And it's it, it factors in more on lease negotiation than it does on third-party delivery contract negotiation. So let's flip to the next one. If you haven't negotiated those fees out of the calculation of gross sales, then there might be a way for you to get your sales reports differently from the third-party delivery company that show your net bottom line number uh, net of their fees so that when you report sales, you're reporting what's actually hitting your bottom line. 
Um, most of the time when we negotiate leases, we negotiate credit card fees and uh, you always negotiate out taxes. And so if you can get third party delivery fees out, whether you're doing a renewal or new leases, it's highly important to, to address that because it is extraordinarily expensive if you don't. Um, and I think, yeah, that's our, that's our, that's our last slide here where it just sort of told, it tells the process by which you might report to the landlord. So do not pay percentage rent on the gross if they're netting out 30% later. It's something to look at in the future. As the real estate market changes its perception of how important restaurants are, this is the time. We're about to be in the driver's seat again for real estate and this is the time to negotiate that stuff. So feel free to reach out with any questions. Look forward to talking to you guys more about this in the deep dive. And I'd love to hear more about um, what innovations you have seen, because I would love to take that back to some of the people that are struggling. And I know you guys have seen things that I haven't seen, and I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you, David. Great information. Uh, the, the innovation examples were terrific. And that tip at the end about uh, netting out the fee is really an important one at this time as cash is king right now. So we're going to shift gears now. We're going to talk about how to navigate the chaos of the day. To present this topic, we've got Mr. Dale Buckner, CEO of Global Guardian, retired Special Forces Green Beret officer. Dale has lived and operated in over seven countries globally. We have created a little nickname for Dale. We call him the Dale Man instead of the Mailman because he always delivers. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your hats. Take it away, Dale Buckner. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, everybody. Uh, I definitely think I'll probably be the black horse of the day uh, as a bit of an outsider as we go through this. But I, I chose this topic, obviously, because to the other speakers, I think we're all feeling some version of this, some more than others. Um, but I thought these topics of travel, how hurricane season will be different this year with COVID-19, and just some commentary on the security, the security environment we have here in the U.S. and abroad, and frankly, what does that mean moving forward in the, both the short term and the long term? And that part of it's probably a little bit political. Um, I know I'll open myself up for a little bit of uh, criticism, depending where you sit politically, but I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Um, but I think these are important topics for all of us to, to kind of think through. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, travel, I really just have three slides here. This is the first of the key topics. I know most of you are seeing this, you're tracking it. The globe has shut down. I'm 52 years old, I've never seen anything like it. You know, in the early stage of this, it felt very much like 9-11. Um, and I think some of those trends of what happened after 9-11, you're, you're, we're reliving that right now. And TSA is a very easy example of after 9-11, it took three years to get TSA stood up and to be functional. Uh, I think a lot of the changes associated with travel and COVID will literally take at least another 12 to 18 months. Let's assume we had a vaccine today. There's 7.5 billion people on the planet how long is it going to take to scale out and get everyone vaccinated until we start to feel comfortable? It's not going to happen overnight. So everything associated with travel will be affected. As you look at these first bullets, uh, you're seeing it now in real time. This is changing every day. And Central South America is exploding right now. Brazil has real problems, as does Mexico, as does Central America. Uh, we don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Um, I think as you look at or you look for good news in that part of the world, if you are still looking to travel, uh, say in July or August, August, there are some, some areas of the Caribbean and South America and the islands that are opening up. So Antigua, Jamaica, St. Lucia, the U.S. Virgin Islands are all open now. Aruba, the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos will follow in the next two to four weeks. So there are some openings here, right here in our hemisphere, if you're in the US, and I think that's you know a mixed bag. As you look at Europe, and you're seeing this, this just broke in the last 48 hours, the Europeans, the European Union are considering not allowing the US, not allowing Brazil, and not allowing Russia in, but there's pockets. And this, this conversation, this term called a travel bubble or a travel corridor, I think is very real. If you're Italy, you need tourism dollars. You're going to open yourself up 
uh, to most of Western Europe. That is going to happen here slowly but surely. New Zealand and Australia have opened a corridor because they feel comfortable with their stats on COVID to open up. I think obviously with avoiding all the political stuff, the US, you know, we're not in a great spot here. We have not done well. We're not going to do well in our opinion. And I think the US, the Mexico border, the Canadian border looking north will remain closed uh, through at least August, maybe even into September. And as you look at this, we still believe we're in phase one. We never transitioned out. You're seeing surges in California, Texas, Florida, uh, Arizona, so on and so forth. We never finished phase one. Uh, so we certainly aren't near phase two yet. So I know that we probably all felt a little bit optimistic that by now we would see a phase two. And unfortunately, I don't think that's real. Um, below, I do think this is happening. For the last three months, we've been briefing this as theory that your travel experience when you do travel is going to start to change. What I would tell you is it's different by airline, it's different by region, it's different, different by country. That being said, Delta Airlines, I'm a Delta guy, they have come out and said 60% sales of the aircraft, no middle seat. They're asking you to bring a mask with the ability to turn you away if you don't bring your own. If they hand you one and you don't take it, they reserve the right to refuse you. Uh, I think all of this is the quote unquote new normal until we get a vaccine, if we get a vaccine, because that's not guaranteed. And we start to formalize this. Last comment here before I move on. I do think the longer this lasts, I think you will start to see, you know, the top 12 international airports in the United States start to push out where you check in. You're, have, you're gonna have a contactless experience. You're gonna turn your bags in in the parking lot so we're not bringing people to the terminal and having people stand on top of each other. You're gonna see more facial recognition. Uh, although the TSA has, you know, kicked and screamed, they don't wanna get involved in this. They have been forced to open much like the screening scenario we went through back after 9-11, I think they're going to eventually just simply have to get on board. Um, the concept of an immunity passport, meaning you will have to be stamped that you are clear of COVID-19 within 24 to 48 hours of travel is coming. And it's specifically coming for the second and third world. There are gonna be parts of Africa that simply cannot afford to do biometrics and screen you and have advanced systems like the West will. All of those things I think are now becoming a reality. They're no longer theory. The question will be how quickly do they scale and who changes the fastest? That part is still being developed. This will change over time, but make no mistake, it's changing and it's real. Uh, next slide, please. What's different this year with hurricanes? If you thought three years ago, the two back-to-back -back hurricanes that did major damage in the Caribbean, and one of them landed in Houston, where Stephen is, did some serious damage, think about the response, whether that's medical evacuation, whether that is gangs running around and looting, think about how much weaker our systems are today because of COVID that if we have another major strike that comes into the Gulf or comes off the Atlantic and rips through the Caribbean or goes into Mexico or comes into the US and hits the normal spots traditionally seen, I would tell you this, as a business or as a family, as an adult, a parent, you should really rethink who is key and essential in your business. And if there are storms on the horizon, whether you should go on that trip with your family to those islands that have opened up that we talked about. And what is that trigger to get out of the way earlier? And here's why. If you thought we had problems getting people out of the Caribbean, we're evacuating parts of Houston or Miami after the last round, uh, can you imagine how much more difficult it'll be now? Uh, law enforcement with everything going on in the security world is overwhelmed or doesn't wanna act. The medical situation, you're gonna have people that don't wanna engage because people aren't wearing masks. You have 40 million plus Americans now on welfare that have lost and soon will lose that bottom rung or that safety net. And desperate people do desperate things in these scenarios. So if you're in the Caribbean and you make the decision as many did after you know three years ago, 
I'm going to ride this out because I don't believe the storm's going to hit St. Thomas or St. Croix or Puerto Rico or St. John's. And now you're stuck. The number of commercial aircraft that are flying today are less than 40% of what they would have been. Commercial traffic will not be available. Commercial airliners will not be there to get you out either before in the last minute or after. Uh, airspace, almost all the airspace and almost all the borders around the world, for the most part, are closed. So even if we can get you out of St. John's, which is gonna be open, where do I take you? And what country is going to accept you now becomes a really interesting issue. If you think the supply chain for your hotel, your restaurant, your bar, your scuba diving business, whatever business you're in, pharmaceuticals, huge business in Puerto Rico, if you thought the supply chain was strained to respond and rebuild your infrastructure and come in and get your, your business up and running was strained prior, right now the entire global supply chain, whether it is nails, drywall, wood, two by fours, whatever it might be, if you thought it was strained prior, it's extreme now. So our response just by definition with less planes, less ships, strain supply strain, we're gonna have you know, a real problem responding this year to hurricane season. And right now they're predicting 13 to 17 storms. Uh, on average, 10 to 12 is average. So we're going to see as the ocean is warmer, uh, a very active season. So it's going to be incredibly interesting what happens here. And then lastly, that last bullet, if you have someone injured, one of your employees, one of your family members injured in one of these hurricane zones, the ability to get you out three years ago was hard. Now it'll be even more difficult. So the advice for all of this is think through it, have triggers, and have the discipline to make the decision. If it's a business, op you know, a business operating unit, get key and essential people out early, be truly prepared. If it's a family vacation and it's coming up through the Bahamas, get out of the way. Don't worry about the thousand dollars you spent. It's simply not worth it because getting you out will be too high risk. Next slide, please. And lastly, and this is probably a very politicized uh, slide and I don't intend to create any enemies here, but I'm open to criticism here because I'm gonna speak very frankly and very directly and I'm, I'm not gonna shy away from a bit of that. I would say I would ask you to divorce yourself of your politics. For the next two minutes, I don't care about blue, I don't care about red, I don't care if you love Donald Trump or hate Donald Trump, none of it matters. What is undeniable is there are 40 million Americans that have lost their safety net or will and are in real trouble economically. Businesses, everyone on this call, unless you're in the, the sanitation business, you make bleach, uh, you're in the business I'm in that is surging, uh, there are real issues in corporate America and it's not going away anytime soon. As I stated earlier, until we get a vaccine, do not think, and if you do believe this, I would, I'm happy to have this discussion if you disagree with my thesis, until we get a vaccine, there is no going back to normal. There will be a new normal, and that new normal is going to be hard, and it is going to be fraught with risk, physical risk, cyber risk, uh, and business risk. All of those things are real. As you look at this, uh, this, this whole issue of police brutality, it's not going away. It's not gonna calm down. Uh, in the environment we're in, it is going to create chaos. Uh, I have never seen in 52 years on this planet more disruption over politics, race, religion, and sexuality in my life. Right, wrong, or indifferent, we're at where we're at. So the question is, as a business leader, as a parent, how do you operate in this environment and how do you navigate this? And make no mistake, I think what you're seeing on the edges of our society is they have lost confidence, that fourth bullet down or fifth bullet down in the social contract that the US government is going to secure them and provide a safe environment. Whether you agree or disagree, immaterial. The fact that that is out there is not negotiable, it is real. You're seeing it every day, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. As I stated on the last, second to last slide, desperate people do desperate things. I'm worried about the economy. I'm worried about the people that were already at the bottom rung of society and what this means to them. We have now deployed in 18 US cities, and we are seeing enormous requirements 
for the privatization of security and medical support in the US. Now we've been, we're a nine year old firm. We've been internationally focused outward. 45% of my business will be now in the US. I, I think that you're going to see if you're in business, you are more on your own than ever before financially, more on your own in the cyber world, more on your own in the medical world, obviously with all these precautions of business and COVID. And lastly, more on your own in securing your space than ever before. And I don't think this cycle is going to end in the next 12 months. I think we are in a 12 to 18 month period where we've got to see this come back in the pendulum swing back into somewhere in the middle. And politically, that's right now, there's a lot of uncertainty. What happens in November matters. Where we end up matters. And can we bring the temperature of the country down matters. But in the short term, make no mistake, you are more on your own as a business leader and as a parent than ever before. And you shouldn't take that lightly and you shouldn't not take that seriously. And again, I don't see us going back to quote unquote normal anytime soon. Even if we had the, the vaccine tomorrow, it will take months to get the West primarily stabilized and then we go into Africa and Asia and Central South America. It's going to take time. There's no short turn here. Um, so as you look at this, I know that's not great news or very uplifting, but I would tell you, take it seriously and try and divorce yourself of the emotion of the politics and look at what's going on factually and look at the temperature of the country and say to yourself, what does this mean to my business and what does it mean to my family? Thank you very much. I look forward to the uh, fireside chats. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Dale. Insightful as always. Great information. I want everybody to know that Dale and his team, as I mentioned, travel risk mitigation, but they also have developed a terrific reopening protocol program that uh, you can find on their website, or I think we have it on our Converge blog. I'll make sure we get it up before the before the uh, deeper dive. Uh, but he also, he and his firm also focus on creating travel policies, and they spend a lot of time with the Fortune 1000. But look, there's a lot of hotel and restaurant groups that we work with when we talk to them about safety and security for their traveling employees. They look at us and have no idea what we're talking about. And today, and in the future, as Dale just mentioned, it's going to be even more important that you consider those types of policies and protocols for traveling people uh, and, and keeping them safe and secure. And then can you even bring them back, as Dale mentioned? So, Dale, we'll look forward to your deeper dive. Thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's shift gears now and let's talk about the top 10 things I wish I knew about my liquor license premises. And we've got the best person in the country to talk to you about that. Miss Elizabeth DeConti, a shareholder at Gray Robinson. Elizabeth and her team and their alcohol beverage practice focus on Tide House trade practices and advertising and promotions. They, they have spent over, well, they have a wealth of experience representing suppliers, retailers, and third-party agencies around the country. Ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth DeConti. Thank you, Stephen, and hello, everyone. Um, this presentation is going to be a, a homage parody to the old David Letterman show for those who used to enjoy that program and the top 10 list that, that would occur each evening. What we started pre-COVID, because we always plan in advance for this conference, it was with a collection of items that we thought all licensees, whether you particularly on-premise licensees, but those in the off-premises space as well, these are the 10 things that we see as ups or go wrong most often of the time. And as we drifted into this COVID world, um, there are several things on this list that I can update for you. So the goal here is to issue spot some, some items for you and also to um, make sure wherever jurisdiction you're located in, um, these things are, are working for you. Now, I don't know why the format of this slide is off. It looks off to me, but the, the, the number, top, number 10 on the top 10 list is I need to notify government authorities when I restructure, change an officer, or change my DBA name. You know, unfortunately now with the economic hard hit that our 
retail licensees across the country are seeing over the next several months, we're going to see the necessity of some of these filings because we're going to have financial reorganizations. Unfortunately, we're going to have um, chapter 11 reorganizations and bankruptcy. We're going to have some mergers. We're going to have some layoffs. Um, some corporate uh, balloon packages are going to be handed out. And so we're going to have numerous circumstances where we're going to have to amend our liquor license filings. And those are very important. Um, especially in this volatile economic environment, if we have a sale of a licensee of a restaurant or of a hotel or a chain of them, or, or a chain let, as one of my colleagues said earlier today, if, if those records aren't right, those transactions won't go forward and, and we need to make sure that we fix that. So in this time of chaos, when there are so many things going on, this is a reminder for you that if you have changes on the corporate level, you need to make sure um, that your liquor licenses are amended accordingly. Next slide, please. Number nine, um, special wet zoning restrictions may apply to outside patios or outside areas. So as, as those of you who operate a retail premises know, in any jurisdiction, when you apply for a liquor license, you have to mark off the license area. And the local jurisdiction frequently controls what type of alcohol service you may have outside. Um, if you look at the patio in my photo, for example, you'll see some natural barriers in the form of plants that are near that licensed premises. And some locations require that, or they may require a physical fence with, with documented or clearly marked ingress and egress. And there are um, special use provisions that may apply. You might need to get a special permit in your jurisdiction to serve out there. But what's happening now across the country as a result of social distancing and capacity restrictions on a lot of our licensed premises, local jurisdictions are waiving some of these requirements and they're actually allowing um, licensed retailers, restaurants in particular, to expand their space by moving outdoors. So for example, you could have a neighboring street blocked off to vehicular traffic and you could have tables spread out out there. If this is happening in your local jurisdiction or places where you operate a restaurant, I would just encourage you to be very cautious about making sure that you're checking all your boxes with your local authorities before you embark on this type of new seating arrangement. Chances are um, you will need to connect with state liquor licensing, local zoning authorities, and probably the fire department about making sure that you are spreading your uh, occupancy correctly. Next slide, please. Number eight. My guests may not be able to self-serve their own alcoholic beverages. Well, as some of you know, uh, some states allow what we call growlers or crowlers. Usually what that means is it's a reusable self-serve container that the guest brings to the licensed premises. And depending on the rules of the particular jurisdiction, um, those things may or may not be allowed. But secondly, how they get filled is a regulated issue. So in some jurisdictions, the consumer may take his or her container or growler, bring it to the tap or other large vessel and refill it. In other um, states that allow this kind of activity, only the retailer's employees may do the filling. I would suggest to you that if this is something you're interested in and if you operate a retail premises in a jurisdiction where this is allowed, you really need to double check whether it's allowed now. Because as you can imagine um, with COVID, it, we're, we're not touching things that other people are touching and certainly we're being very cautious about containers we're using. So the idea of using a refillable container that has been in someone else's control uh, for some period of time may not be acceptable now, even if it was before. So if you operate a, a, a premises where this is an issue, I would suggest that you check on that. Next slide. Number seven, we can't automatically deliver alcohol just because we already deliver food. This is a big topic now that we've all talked about it. Um, some colleagues on this call have talked about it. I've talked about it um, in various hospitality lawyer conferences over the past several months. So 
let's just break it down a little bit. The delivery of alcohol in general pre-COVID is a regulated activity. Not all jurisdictions allow the delivery of alcoholic beverages. If they do, there are rules about who may deliver that product, whether a third party unlicensed deliverer or common carrier must or may deliver that product or whether the retailers uh, license employees may do the delivering or have to. Um, and what you're seeing now in the role in the era of COVID is that we have regulatory relief on this issue such that some jurisdictions either by um, executive order or otherwise or some regulatory relief issued by the governing alcohol agency and we have practices in place that are temporary, at least for now, about whether alcohol can be delivered and how. Um, there are a lot of restrictions around that delivery. Does it have to be um, in a manufacturer's original sealed container or may it be a mixed drink prepared by the retailer? If it's the latter, um, are there restrictions on how that mixed drink must be transported and where in the vehicle? All of these things are regulated and what we're seeing now, which will be a trend going forward, is some jurisdictions are actually enacting some legislation to assist licensed retailers to make some of this, these delivery mechanisms permanent. And there are a few states, um, Illinois, Ohio, New Jersey, Louisiana are a few of them that have enacted um, legislation, at least on a temporary basis for a year or so to allow these activities. Next slide. Number six, we can't serve alcoholic drinks in any size container we want. There are limits. This is simply designed to say um, pre-COVID, we, we saw a lot of larger chain retailers developing large format vessels for their menus. Um, if you remember, uh, the old kind of a fishbowl style, that's one, one style of these large format vessels. Can, what constitutes a drink and the size of the vessel it may be served in is a regulated issue on a state by state basis. Next slide, please. Number five, we can't necessarily provide the same drink specials in every state where we operate. This is something we've talked about many times, but I, I can't help but include it because it remains of interest to people. Um, there's no question that alcoholic beverage sales um, have better markup than some other products on retailers' menus. And for that reason, they are frequently used as a way to drive traffic to restaurants. And as we reopen, I'm sure we're going to continue to see that. But you need to be aware that um, there are numerous individual state and even local regulations, depending on where you are, that govern these drink special rules or pricing rules, or we used to call them happy hour restrictions. Um, and there has not been any regulatory relief on those issues as a result of COVID. So as we reopen and people are being very innovative as to how to get people comfortable dining out and drinking out again, be mindful that those restrictions still exist. Next slide, please. Number four, suppliers can't walk in here and start giving away gift cards to my employees. Um, people have heard me say this before. This is a tied house issue. Tied house laws govern the financial relationships between licensed suppliers and distributors of alcoholic beverages and licensed retailers in the alcohol beverage industry. Um, Tide House laws prohibit giving away what we call unlawful things of value unless those items are subject to specifically enumerated um, legislated exceptions. We have a federal Tide House law in the United States, which is um, enforced by the US Tax and Trade Bureau, affectionately known as the TTB. Um, and each state also has its own Tide House law. I, I wanted to spend an extra minute on this today just to be clear with you that I think we're going to be seeing um, Tide House risk going forward because of the great financial pressures that are on all three tiers, frankly, the retailers especially, but even on the upper tier members, there, there have been um, restricted sales of product and there's going to be a great drive to recover some of that bottom line that has been lost. And we need to be mindful as, as counselors for um, all levels of licensees in the three-tier system that state regulatory agencies have been very clear that there's no regulatory relief or restriction around lifting Tidehouse uh, regulations and rules. 
And so we need to be watchful that industry members aren't inadvertently or otherwise uh, violating these rules in, in an effort to be aggressive and get back on track. Next slide. Number three. Um, we might not be able to mix alcoholic beverages ourselves and keep them in batches in our own containers. Um, this practice called batching was fairly popular uh, pre-COVID. If you think about uh, sangria or other mixed drinks that are amenable to being served in pitchers and being made ahead of time, um, this is activity that goes on and it's legal in many jurisdictions, but there's, there are a lot of restrictions around it that are mainly driven by uh, public health concerns, which I imagine will be only heightened now in the era of COVID. Those concerns deal, about, deal with freshness um, and making sure that these mixed drinks are not kept too long and that they're stored properly, in addition to issues about transparency with the consumer about what he or she is actually um, consuming. Next slide, please. Number two, uh, this is an important one now. My 18 year old employees may not be able to perform all alcohol tasks in the licensed premises. So in general, um, before we became involved in the tremendous uh, strain on employee relations and, and management that COVID has imposed upon us, this is an issue um, in liquor licensed premises as follows. So. Um, Many states and even local jurisdictions specify by law the age an employee has to be to do certain things. So for example, in a restaurant, some states have rules that say 18 year olds may bus and clear tables, but they may not pour alcohol and they may not serve. You have to be 21 to do that. In addition, there are other um, training requirements that are fairly specific for 18, 19, 20, and 21 year olds, depending on where you are. And again, um, in some places, you may only perform certain functions in the restaurant with regard to alcohol um, if you've passed those training courses. And I have some of the functions here that are most common on the slide. Some states break this down for every one of these functions, taking orders, pouring, actually just bringing a drink that someone else prepared to the table and then busting the table. And of course, uh, permits are required for many of these activities. So if you fast forward to today, our current situation, think about how challenging it is for owners of restaurants, for example, to manage who is working on what day because of the COVID situation, to space out employees, and now add to it the layer about age requirements and know that that is a factor in some jurisdictions. When you are serving alcohol inside the restaurant again, you need to make sure that the range of people you have on staff during a particular shift will meet these requirements under the local rules. Next slide, please. And finally, the number one thing I wish I knew about my liquor license premises is suppliers can't pay us to plaster their logos and brand materials all over the premises. This is a tight house issue again. Um, a, a licensed supplier of alcoholic beverages cannot pay for the privilege to place its logos, artwork, or other materials on the licensed premises. Certainly, um, we have exceptions which allow those licensees to give certain items subject to Tide House exceptions, but they can't pay for that privilege because otherwise we end up with violations of federal and state Tide House law, such as slotting fees and quid pro quos. Again, um, a cautionary flag. This is why this is number one. We're in hard economic times, people. Um, and I think that we're going to see a temptation in this area. And we just need to be very clear that we can't accept money if we're representing retailers from suppliers for things that they cannot otherwise pay for. The temptations will be great, but we need to we need to hold fast to the law because it's become clear that enforcement is back up. Um, and you will see suspensions and revocations of, of liquor licenses if, if these provisions aren't complied with. So with that, um, I will turn the floor back over and I look forward to seeing you in the, in the short sessions, the close groups, and we can go over questions at that time. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Great information as always. You know, j just to validate what you said about enforcement with some of the reopening restrictions, several bars have had their liquor licenses 
suspended here in Texas. I think the number was up to 12 or 14, I heard yesterday. So the enforcement of the Alcohol Beverage Commission is alive and well. And I think that that guidance and warning is, is, uh, should be heeded. So thank you very much as usual. Look forward to hearing from you on Tuesday. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's, uh, we've been talking about alcohol. Let's take the next step and let's talk about cannabis and hemp up in smoke, how the hospitality industry can avoid traps for the unwary. Joining us today to talk about this topic is Emily Harris Gant, a shareholder with Foster Garvey PC. Emily is the firm-wide practice group leader in the commercial intellectual property and technology transaction group. She also chairs the cannabis industry group. In her practice, she and her team advise producers, processors, retailers, third-party service providers, as well as hospitality companies. Emily, take it away. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. Um, I'm excited to speak with everyone today. Uh, like Elizabeth, we had planned for some certain topics pre-COVID um, because we get so many questions from those in the hospitality industry about cannabis and hemp. I think it's all the more relevant now because so many different um, properties within the hospitality industry are really looking for different ways to generate additional revenue. And many of them are looking to see whether and how they can incorporate cannabis based um, sales services products um, into their premises. So I want to make sure that um, as you do so uh, that you don't um, unnecessarily trip uh, over your own feet. So let's talk, let's dig in. Uh, next slide, please. So first, for those of you that are um, kind of uh, new or, or starting to explore um, cannabis and hemp, I thought it'd be helpful to just provide a basic primer on, on what exactly is the difference between cannabis and hemp. And so the way that I like to think about this is that cannabis and hemp are literally the same plant. And the only difference between a cannabis plant and a hemp plant is THC content. So THC is the substance within um, cannabis that makes people feel high, feel stoned. Um, but just like if I'm an apple farmer, I can grow pink lady apples or I can grow um, a honey crisp apple. But at the end of the day, I'm still growing apples. It's the same thing with cannabis and hemp. It is all the same plant. Um, so uh, cannabis remains federally illegal, um, and though there hasn't been any enforcement action, um, that is either legal or decriminalized in more than 40 states. Um, hemp has become federally legal pursuant to the 2018 Farm Bill. It does need to be grown in compliance with applicable law, whether that's um, the applicable state law or if that state doesn't necessarily have um, hemp-based laws, you do so pursuant to the Farm Bill and the implementing regulations of the USDA. Uh, cultivation of hemp is also legal in 40 plus states. If we could hit the next slide, please. So this is just a quick overview to give you a visual on where cannabis is either legal or decriminalized. Um, cannabis is legal recreationally in roughly 11 states. Um, there are approximately half of the states um, in the U.S. And a, and a growing number every day that have um, medical marijuana or cannabis that has gone online. And then there are a handful of states in which it's just an absolute no dice, do not pass go, you cannot engage in any cannabis or hemp activities. Um, next slide, please. This is a similar map, but just displaying where hemp is legal. Um, one of the challenging things to be mindful of when it comes to hemp is that there was a 2014 farm bill that talked about industrial hemp. It had a very similar definition, but there were a number of states that passed laws in line with the 2014 farm bill that talk about the concept of industrial hemp. Industrial hemp um, has limited permissible uses. And so it's really only supposed to be used for kind of, um, kind of agricultural purposes, um, marketing that state's um, uh, ag, things of that nature, even though I think we all will know that um, it was truly used for purposes much broader than that. The language in the 2018 Farm Bill doesn't talk about industrial hemp, it just talks about hemp. 
and there aren't these um, restrictions on um, marketing for agricult ag agricultural purposes, easy for me to say. Um, and instead, what the 2018 Farm Bill does is really talk about the cultivation of hemp. Um, other states have talked about the processing of hemp. Um, and very few states talk about the retail sales of hemp. Um, in most states, that's not uh, regulated in any way. It's an important thing for this um, group to think about because many um, on this, uh, watching this call will be in the position of, of selling hemp or hemp-based products um, at a retail, uh, at, on a retail basis. These are the 40 plus states in which hemp in some form or another is um, legal. And I hope that it's useful. Turning to the next slide, please. So if you're looking at the amount of uh, revenue that's being generated by hemp and cannabis, um, it, is, it is exploding. Um, I saw data that the size of the hemp um, opportunity is supposed to be at $3 million, billion with a B, by 2025. Uh, recently, Penn State um, came out with a survey or, or a research survey that indicated that um, looking at Denver in the year after recreational cannabis went live resulted in uh, $130 million in new hotel revenue um, for that city. Now, much of that was driven by an increase in roommates, and they saw that that number kind of evened out in the following years, in part because people were struggling with how to um, capture the other revenue streams um, about sales, about um, services, et cetera. And so that's one of the things that we're gonna focus on when we're talking about these traps for the unwary. Uh, next slide, please. So trap number one is, you know, you, you are at a property, perhaps you're a hotel or a restaurant, and you are really excited about, say, um, a CBD-infused cocktail. Or if you're a hotel and you want to do a, a CBD-infused um, uh, spa services, you want to offer lotions, you want to do things of this nature. Um, and I think we all will know that um, the liquor license is a primary source of revenue for most in the hotel industry. Um, all, I, I don't want to say with certainty every single state, but I think uh, it's fair to say that the vast majority of states that have legalized cannabis in some form or another say that, you ca that alcohol and cannabis never the twain shall meet. So you cannot um, allow for the consumption of cannabis on a liquor license premises. You cannot sell cannabis on a liquor license premises. And so if you do so on the cannabis side, you um, run the risk of, of having your liquor license pulled. Hemp is a touch of a different story. Um, some states treat hemp as though it is cannabis, as though they are the same thing. Um, and so that's obviously a problem. Other states have threaded the needle a touch and they've said, so long as hemp is legal in this state, um, and so long as the liquor licensee is offering hemp in permissible ways, no harm, no foul. Um, I think my best advice on this is to talk to your enforcement officer. So before your property launches, say that, you know, CBD-based massage, give your enforcement officer a call, talk to him or her about their thoughts on this, and then um, assuming that you like the answer, get it documented in writing. Another thing that we're really seeing, um, particularly uh, hotels and, oops, sorry, if we can go back, please. Um, thank you. Uh, people are struggling with is that oftentimes their servers are trained on how to um, monitor overconsumption when it comes to alcohol. You know, perhaps they've kept a mental note of how many um, beers they've served that guest. Um, they've been trained um, on how to monitor if someone is slurring their speech or something else. But not all staff has been trained on what happens if someone walks into your premises and they, they have consumed cannabis before they got there. How does that um, impact that person's level of sobriety? And so it's really important to train your staff on over service when it comes to the combination of cannabis and alcohol. Okay, thank you, next slide. So trap number two is using hemp inside of food or beverages. So uh, the 2018 Farm Bill says, look, you know, nothing in the 2018 Farm Bill impacts the FDA's jurisdiction um, over foods and beverages. Uh, the FDA has approved a drug called Epidiolex. 
that and components of that drug include CBD and THC. And so the FDA has taken the position that they are a drug. You cannot put drugs inside of foods or beverages. And so it is it is pursuant to the FDA's position, it is federally illegal to put um, THC or CBD, even if those things are hemp-based, inside of a food or beverage if it's introduced into interstate commerce. Some people say, no problem, I will keep everything in state. <laughs> I will you know, buy from that uh, hemp processor in my state. I will keep everything within state lines. Um, one, that's a very, very difficult needle to thread, so I, I would suggest speaking with your legal advisor before you do that. And two, there are a lot of states that simply follow the FDA guidance, and even though FDA talks about things going across state lines, the state may say, hey, even if it's totally intrastate, you cannot put um, CBD or THC inside of a food or beverage. Um, and tied to this, again, is that if you do so in, uh, particularly in, say, that CBD infused cocktail, again, you could lose your liquor license. Next slide, please. So trap three is accepting percentage-based um, fees or revenue from a cannabis licensee. And so um, David earlier was talking about percentage-based rent. Let's say that you're saying, okay, I'm going to um, treat a, a cannabis business as a concessionaire, and I'm going to take percentage-based rent from that. Or um, I'm going to do marketing materials, and, I, and I'm going to advertise in my hotel that there's a, a cannabis licensee down the street, and I'm just going to take, you know, 5% of the sales that come from our guests. Um, we see a lot of hotels and restaurants looking at this model, and it's a, it's a very, very dangerous model. <laughs> um, what we see is that um, not all, but many states that have legalized particularly recreational cannabis, um, they ask in the licensing process for the disclosure of any person or entity that receives any percentage of, um, of sales, of gross or net. Some states have a threshold, so anybody over 10%. Other states, like my home state of, of, of Washington, I'm out here in Seattle, if you receive any percentage-based compensation whatsoever, you have to be on the license. So disclosed, vetted, source of funds, you have to be on the license. Um, and so the, the solution to this is to simply turn to, to flat fees. Um, I know that to some in the industry this is less attractive, but it's, um, it's from a risk management perspective, it's, a, it's often a much better path. Okay, next slide, please. Track number four is failing to update your insurance policies and, um, and also just chatting with your broker. So, you know, I think most of us in the hospitality industry, we get the standard commercial general liability policies. We check to ensure that there's things like a, a, a liquor liability writer, things of that nature, but we haven't necessarily looked to see whether there are exclusions for hemp or cannabis-based um, or related claims. And so when you do look at those claims, you'll see that there are very specific exceptions um, for cannabis uh, products liability claims. Um, and so talk to your broker and um, see if that may um, pose a problem here. Next slide, please. Track number five is really failing to use a compliance officer. Um, we see this as being most helpful, particularly in the hemp space. So um, uh, the rules are constantly changing in the hemp space right now. So we've been asked by clients to do a, a 50 state survey of all of the hemp laws, and we're happy to do it. Um, but we let people know, you know, what may be true on Monday may not be true on Friday. Um, and while there's always a risk that laws are going to change in any given jurisdiction, it is particularly particularly true in hemp right now, um, it is incredibly challenging to uh, stay on track and um, be knowledgeable about all these different changing laws. Um, so a point of person within your organization who's going to serve as your compliance um, officer, have that person be charged with, you know, with keeping track of these things. Have a compliance plan. You know, in that compliance plan, talk about have we spoken with our insurance broker? Have we updated all of our standard contracts, like um, our vendor contracts? In those vendor contracts, are we doing things like including venue clauses that say that we are not gonna take any dispute to federal court? Um, 
Do you want to focus on arbitration? How, what are you going to do on the employment side? What if there are employees that have um, kind of religious or moral objections to providing that CBD-based spa? How does this impact your union? You know, so there's all that it's a it's a complex thing that um, hotel and restaurant clients really need to be mindful of before they dip their toe in. Um, and appointing an, uh, a compliance officer and having a plan is really um, key to this success. That's the end of my presentation. Um, I would love to continue the conversation with, uh, with you all during our deeper dive and to hear how your properties are uh, dipping their toes into the hemp and cannabis spaces. Thank you. Emily, thank you. That's fascinating. Uh, very helpful information uh, to keep us on track and to keep us from getting into trouble. And as Elizabeth pointed out, enforcement is, is picking up, not slacking off. And I'm sure it's true in this space as well. Are you seeing that? To some extent, I think that right now, you know, many of the states that particularly that have recreational cannabis, um, they also govern alcohol. And so a lot of their regulatory mindset is looking to how can we keep restaurants alive? What kind of expanded um, possibilities do we see about service and delivery of alcohol? That said, um, the consequences associated with um, doing something inappropriate with cannabis are huge. You can be charged with a felony. And so um, it's better to be safe than sorry on these things. Absolutely. Great, great guidance. Thank you very much, Emily. Terrific as usual. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk now about the hazy science of CBD. And we've got two experts joining us for this, both out of the RIMCAS Toxicology and Food Safety uh, Group there. Uh, the RIMCAS Consulting Group provides experts for lots of uh, litigation support areas, and this is their Toxicology and Food Safety Group. So joining us first is Mr. Christopher. Christopher Spaeth, uh, PhD. He's a senior consultant with 15 years of toxicology experience. He's uh, spent, with, and I'm sorry, lots of industrial experience in the consumer and regulatory toxicology. Joining Christopher today will, uh, will be Scott Druid, and I'm sorry, Scott Druin. And Scott is also a senior consultant with 22 years of toxicology experience. He's an expert on health risks from substance exposures and food and the environment. Please welcome, uh, please welcome these two experts, Scott and Christopher. Gentlemen, teach us all you know about CBD. Thank you so much. Um, today, uh, my colleague, Dr. Scott Druin, and I will discuss some of the misinformation and safety hazards that exist due to the rapid rise of the cannabidiol or CBD market and what some of the regulations say about them. As we look for ways to stay calm in the current environment, we want to make you aware that the CBD you buy might not actually be doing what you think it is. So um, we want to start talking about what is CBD. Um, CBD stands for cannabidiol. Um, to the right, I'm showing the chemical structure of CBD, which provides information to toxicologists like Dr. Drew and myself about some of the chemical and toxicological properties. CBD is not likely to cross the outer protector layer, protective layer of skin, and thus skin administration is unlikely to produce systemic effects. Um, that is, when you put it on your skin, it's not gonna pass through and not likely to cure whatever ails you. Um, once in the body, it's unlikely to easily distribute across many tissue types or get to uh, many different types of organs. Unlike tetrahydrocannabidol or THC, CBD is not psychoactive. <clears throat> uh, when available, um, it binds cannabinoid receptors termed CB1 in a way that deactivate these receptors. And these receptors are found throughout your entire body, um, including in the brain. Um, in contrast, the psychoactive compound THC activates CB1 receptors. And this is what causes some of the euphoric effects um, following THC administration. Um, and as we talked about, CBD uh, derived from hemp plants is legal under federal law, um, but may be illegal in certain states, whereas CBD derived from marijuana plants is illegal on the federal level, but illegal in certain states. So 
Based on the basic science and toxicological properties of CBD, many of the claims made by distributors of CBD and CBD oil are not true. If you could bring up the image, please. So on the left, we can see a commercial for a CBD product that claims to cure an alphabet soup of maladies. Uh, these range from nervous system disorders to cancers, to sleep disorders, to nausea. Um, it honestly sounds too good to be true. And really it is. Uh, this CBD product, uh, like any other commercial CBD product, contains a potentially unknown amount of CBD. You don't know how much you're getting. Um, to date, the highest level of CBD sold commercially and not as a drug um, is 45%. Um, if you could bring up the next. So the scientific research behind CBD does not back up any of these miraculous claims in double-blind placebo-controlled studies with paired safety tests. Um, that is, we don't know for certain if CD, CBD has any activity in humans um, at the doses approved in this bottle. Um, and we also don't know if it's safe to use um, at these levels. Um, and we also finally don't know whether it's actually efficacious against the maladies that it's claiming. Um, the only FDA approved use for medical, uh, for CBD is treating a rare form of childhood epilepsy when administered at 99% purity. Um, this is a level that is not achieved in any of the commercially available CBD products. Um, in short, there's a very fine line between advertising claims that fall under cosmetics and the medical use for CBD. Um, so um, in conclusion, although CBD and CBD oil purports to be a miracle cure for all that ails you, the scientific facts and safety studies do not support its efficacy or safety when placed on the skin or ingested. Um, and just to remind everybody, CBD is not a cure for COVID-19. Um, and with that, I'll turn the talk over to my colleague. Thank you, Chris. Next slide, please. Hello, everyone. Um, continuing from uh, Chris's section, I'd like to introduce the concept of quality control. So right now, everyone is watching this webinar and you're sitting at home in your office and you might be drinking water or coffee or perhaps getting some food. So normally we trust that the products that we consume will not cause us harm because quality controls are in place to make certain product labels accurately reflect product contents and to assure us that products lack any hazardous components. Now, nowhere is, this, nowhere is it more obvious of a breakdown of quality control in the current uh, environment of COVID-19. Uh, so two days ago, there were warnings and announcements in the media of uh, hand sanitizer. That's something everybody expects is gonna be good for them because it helps combat transmission of infection and so forth. But there were purveyors uh, um, coming south of the border where they found that uh, there was a methanol contamination in these products and absorbed through the skin, methanol is very toxic to individuals. So this is a good example of a breakdown of quality control. So keeping all these examples in mind, I would like to spend the next few minutes discussing the question, what else is in that CBD product that you're using? Next slide, please. So to begin, CBD is isolated from the hemp plant or cannabis sat sativa, which also produces more than 100 other cannabinoids with THC and CBD being the most prevalent. Although the health impacts and toxicity from exposure to THC has been studied extensively, the health impacts from exposure to other cannabinoids, including CBD and ter terpenes, remain largely unknown. Uh, next element. A few years ago, the FDA, as well as an independent research group, tested many CBD products to assess the purity and concentration of their CBD content. Their testing results showed that many of the products, 69% uh, of the total, had levels of CBD not accurately reflected on their product label or did not contain CBD at all. Of greater concern was the observation that 20% of the CBD products were found to have THC levels greater than the regulatory limit of 0.3% and of sufficient concentrations to cause intoxication and impairment. Next element, please. These studies indicate that many CBD products had quality control problems, were misbranded, and were not compliant with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. They also highlight the need for manufacturing and testing standards to reduce inadvertent health effects from exposure to THC contamination. Next slide, please. 
Many other sources of contamination also exist during the farming and processing of hemp to make CBD products. <clears throat> With farming, hemp plants are hyperaccumulators hyper and can acquire heavy metals such as lead, mercury, and arsenic from the soil during growth. Pesticides are also used during farming to protect the plants from animals, insects, and microbes. Now, next element, please. With processing, improper drying and storage of the hemp plant can foster microbial contamination from bacteria such as Salmonella, Enterobacter, Streptococcus, and Klebsiella, and from fungi, including Aspergillus and their mycotoxins. Extraction of the CBD oil from the hemp plant can involve chemical solvents such as butane and is an additional source of contamination. Next element, please. Studies have detected the presence of these biological and chemical contaminants after farming and processing of CBD products. However, gaps in knowledge regarding the exposure risks as well as inconsistent monitoring demonstrate a need to develop testing standards for chemical and biological contaminants and CBD products to avoid potential injuries. Next slide, please. In summary, lack of comprehensive and consistent oversight by state and federal governments has resulted in CBD product safety regulatory gaps increases the, and increases the potential for contaminant exposures and the risk of deleterious health effects. Thank you for your attention and I hope to see you at the deep dive. Thank you so much, Scott and Chris. We really appreciate it. And we, um, we need experts like you because the rest of us have no idea. So that's very helpful. Thank you. And um, you'll be available on Tuesday for your deeper dive so we can have people join you and ask questions then. Thank you guys all so Thank much you. for joining us today and we'll see you all on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.